The AFL-NFL merger is possibly the most important event of the second 50 years of the NFL. It ultimately brought out the best of both leagues to form a dominant force that is now America's favorite sport. However, tension was extremely high leading up to the merger, leaving many wondering if it would ever happen at all. The climax event for this negativity of a possible merger almost derailed talks entirely, and it all revolved around a kicker. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is June 8th, 1966, and we are in New York City. This would be the day where Pete Rozelle officially announced the AFL and NFL merger. It would become one entity, creating the Alpha Professional Sports League in America. Now at the time, though, many were wondering, was this a good thing? Was it a case of the rich just getting richer? We don't know where it was going. At the time, they didn't have any clue. Would it stall player contracts to the point where they didn't want to play anymore? No competition for players between leagues, meaning not a free market, right? What was going to happen? There was a lot of confusion, and there's a lot of worrying going along. But how did it even get to that point where the AFL was considered a force to be reckoned with? Well, let's take it back just a little bit further. A pivotal turning point recognizing the AFL as a threat occurred in 1965 where the AFL had a contract with NBC for $36 million. Plus, they would get more for any kind of playoff games. This was kind of leaning towards that point where it was, you know, the legitimacy of the AFL as a competitor, even though before they had many other types of victories, which we'll discuss in a future episode. However, they were a force that had to be reckoned with. I mean, they had stars like Lance Allworth, Jack Kemp, Joe Namath, and many more were already in the league and growing and gaining public interest. Now, we'll talk more about how the AFL was formed and the years leading up to the merger, including the reasons why the NFL had reason to be getting close to shaking in their britches. And to make sure you get that in all episodes for the show for free, please make sure you mash that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. Also, Head to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and links for the episodes to further your learning experience of the history of the NFL. But getting back to the story here. Like I said, the AFL, they were carrying some weight. No longer that little brother that couldn't be invited to the party. Well, by golly, they're the ones that are hosting the party almost now. So it got to that point. Some league members of the AFL, they thought that they had the opportunity that they could dig in. They could win a battle, possibly, for the NFL for talent and TV time. And one of these crazy cats, he went by the name of Al Davis. Many of us know this guy. At the time, he was the AFL commissioner. And he had a quote kind of describing, after it all went down, what he felt about the whole situation. And it went as such. I was just trying to lead them in the right direction to get what they wanted. I didn't necessarily want a merger, but they wanted it. And they got it. I'll tell you this. We were sitting in Jets owner Sonny Werblin's house, the owners, we were having a meeting. We didn't know if the National Football League was on the level or joking, but I'll never forget one of the owners saying, if they're lying to us, we'll have to drop the bomb on them. We'll drop the bomb and sign all their players. Which was kind of what it was at the point of. 1966, the AFL-NFL war, man, it reached its peak. This was the height of the war between the AFL and NFL. One of the things that I saw was the league had spent a combined $7 million between the two of them to sign their draft picks that year. You know, probably more due to the bidding wars, which is kind of weird because it wasn't like just you had this one set of players to pick from and then it was on your league regardless. It was different. I mean, think about it. There were two different leagues fighting for the same guy. So what they would do is they would draft I don't know, just throw a random name out there. You know, We talked about Lance Allworth. So you draft Lance Allworth in the AFL, maybe, I don't know, six pick overall or something, but then you also draft him in the NFL, 
But they're like, hmm, you have to outweigh the possibility of how likely is he going to play for the AFL as opposed to the NFL. So maybe they, you know, the teams hold off for a while and you don't draft them until the whatever, the 20th pick or something like that. I mean, there aren't that many player teams and stuff, but then you got the other teams or thinking about it and bam, boom, now you got him for like a super cheap price. And you know, I wish you could do that all the time, but it just doesn't work out that way anymore. So the leagues felt that something had to change for the longevity of pro football. And although, you know, you would think that the AFL, the little brother here, they would have come crying to the big brother saying that the kids are picking on me and such, and I want you to help me. Uh, Let's just join up together on the team so we can go forward as one. I saw a little bit different. I saw it where it was actually the NFL that approached the AFL, you know, not the other way around. Like I said, even seems like, why would they do that? Because the AFL was inferior. However, both leagues were smart enough to recognize that if this war continued to go on, it would be detrimental to both leagues. Because, hey, you're fighting for the same player, which means the contracts keep going up. And the NFL's website even said that some of these talks started as early as 1965, but really more like whisperings, probably. You know, the NFL apparently said that it was demanded that the AFL would pay $50 million in indemnity payments for an agreement. And let's just say that's not the AFL's first choice, you know? Not to mention, like we said, we have this Al Davis cat, and he's all, you know, going to stick to his guns, and we ain't going to give in, and that kind of thing. But he wasn't the only one in the AFL that felt like they had a legitimate shot at overtaking the NFL at some point in time, so there had to be something that would be done to kind of bring them both together. And in the spring of 1966, a series of secret meetings about a possible AFL-NFL merger occurred between Lamar Hunt of the Kansas City Chiefs and Tex Schramm of the Dallas Cowboys. Now, supposedly this uh, happened behind Al Davis's back. You know, he didn't know about it. Again, take no prisoners. We all burn with the ship kind of mentality. So they had to kind of be careful about it. Al Davis had just been named the AFL commissioner on April 8th of that same year. So there's a story from Tex Schramm in the Sports Illustrated shortly after the merger was announced discussing how on April 6th of 1966, Lamar Hunt interrupted his trip from Kansas City to Houston to stop in Dallas at Love Field Airport. Tex talked about waiting underneath a Texas Ranger statue in the shadows, you know, kind of like lurking a little bit because they didn't think it was such a good idea for these two owners of opposite leagues to be able to sit there and talk together because it's not like they're talking about the weather you know that kind of thing so they at that point you know it kind of began the the talks of let's get this thing together let's bring these two leagues into one juggernaut of a league to take over america sports so things happen and so on and so forth and after everything was figured out a couple months later they would part off a plane together from washington and found themselves back under that statue and lamar said this about their kind of, I guess you could say, ironic situation. He said, here we are, back at that ranger again, but it doesn't make any difference if anyone sees us or not this time. But one thing that we had to bring up, during these merger talks, it almost ended due to a kicker. (laughs) What? A kicker? How can a kicker have any influence on an AFL-NFL merger? I mean, they're supposed to be, you know, the lonesome kicker thing. We always talk about that reference to Adam Sandler and how in fantasy football, leagues don't even care about kickers are trying to get rid of them and shifting the goalposts around and messing with the kickoff and the list goes on and on and on. But the kicker almost held the power to shut this whole thing down, possibly crippling both leagues to be separate mediocre leagues eating into each other for eternity. Now, it wasn't the actual kicker's action himself that really caused this. It was the gentleman's agreement. I mean, the unwritten rule of If a player signs with one league, then he's hands off for the other league. So, you know, Joe Namath, he signed with the AFL. NFL could not whisk him away because they had this little gentleman's agreement going on. However, in the midst of all these talks, former Buffalo Bills place kicker Pete Gogolak signed with the New York Giants. This almost stopped the merger talks altogether. They were not happy. This was war. You threw the first bullet, you hit the first strike, you did all that other kind of thing, and we're coming back after you tenfold, you know? I mean, it was pretty significant that even Cowboys GM Tex Schramm had a quote about that kicker signing that went as such. That nearly destroyed merger talks. 
What Giants owner Wellington Merritt did was completely legal, but it was also a big thorn in any negotiations. It caused so much animosity that even some of the owners who had been most eager and cooperative about a merger, such as Ralph Wilson, turned the other way. We'd had some, I wouldn't call them fruitful talks, but some positive discussions, and the Gogolak thing ended those pretty quickly for a while. So things were turning worse. They were not headed in the right direction. For something like this, my dad would say, the situation has not improved. That's a uh, quote back from Sean Connery in the, uh, uh, what's that movie called? The In the Animal Jones, the, those, those shows. But truly, they did not improve. Things were getting worse. The AFL, they dug in. They started to load up on ammo as well. They were focusing on the big dogs, though. They were smart. They had a precision strike type of mentality. They would focus on the quarterbacks. I mean, it was true, right? The NFL is a passing league. The QB is considered the most important position in sports. Why not go after them? You can take them out. You can win the war. That's what they were thinking. And of course, you know Al Davis. He played a huge part in this. The Los Angeles Rams signed Roman Gabriel for a contract that would begin in 1967, including a $100,000 bonus for just for signing. Nowadays, that doesn't seem like much, but back in the day, I mean, that was some huge chunk of change. But the AFL did not stop there. They would also approach some other pretty big-name quarterbacks. I mean, Fran Tarkenton, Sonny Jurgensen, John Brody, and Milt Plum were all approached by the AFL to try to bring them to the dark side. So one reason why the AFL was willing to be able to play the whole white and hold game, they were comprised of AFL owners that just basically had more money than most of the NFL owners. They were kind of the new money versus the old money kind of thing. The AFL, they tried to buy their way in. In fact, that's part of the reason why the AFL was created, which we'll get to next week. Many of the NFL teams, you know, they were either from the original founders that were owning the team still, or, you know, passed on generations and that kind of thing. So it wasn't as much of the way that it is nowadays, even where, you know, you have a lot of money, big oil mongers or tech junkie superstars, whatever you want to call it. They nowadays can just go and purchase a team. Back in the day, it was a lot of grassroots founding kind of situations going on. So like I said, new money versus old money. And they weren't taking too kindly to this situation of you can just buy your way into this storied franchise history type of thing of our league. We'll get out of here, man. But due to this and other reasons, of course, in 1966, again, we are at DEFCON 5, DEFCON 3, DEFCON 6, red alert, I don't even know, whatever you call it. But the situation was not looking too well. It was pretty bleak. I mean, the NFL, they were still too big to be taken down, but the AFL, they were not going anywhere, especially not an Al Davis run league. I mean, his kamikaze style type of play. So again, it was mostly in secret. But the talks of the merger would end up intensifying, finally resulting in the announcement of that merger on June 8th, 1966 from Pete Rozelle. And there there were a few different stipulations. And of course, you know, anytime you have an agreement, you got to have something on both sides of the party going on. And part of this agreement, the leagues would be combined to include 24 teams to be increased to 26 in 1968 and 28 by 1970, or at least uh, soon thereafter, you know, horseshoes, hand grenades, and teams in the AFL-NFL merger, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm sure there are many reasons why they decided to put these clauses into their agreement, but it was said that an expansion commitment was primarily kind of like a, we'll call it a pre-strike, not a counter-strike against Congress. Very possible that the Congress of our country would put an axe to the merger because especially in these areas where there weren't teams yet, you know, these governors and state politicians and such, They may try to cite them for antitrust laws. So that's why the NFL and the AFL leaders decided that they would put this in there as part of a way to try to push it through Congress. Some of the agreement also included that all teams would stay in the metropolitan regions and they would not move out. Nor could any new team come into a city by either league, you know, creating that whole competition type of thing and making both of them mediocre and kind of causing some chaos there for the league owners. I mean, along these same lines, this agreement would put a kibosh finally to Milwaukee trying to lure the Green Bay Packers away from Green Bay. So you have this AFL-NFL merger, probably Packer fans to thank for the reason why Green Bay never lost their team. Another agreement 
or part of the agreement would be that the AFL indemnities would be paid to NFL teams sharing a market. From what I understood, it was kind of a way to say, okay, hey, you know, we're here, we're sharing the market with you, and we're coming into your league, but this is kind of us, I guess you could say, buying our way in and being part of the club. So both leagues also, starting in 1967, would have a common draft. No more bidding for which player we're going to get and hoping then if I pick this dude in the fifth number overall pick, he'll actually come to my league and sign with me as opposed to going to the other guys. And with the side note, the first ever draft pick of the new NFL was Bubba Smith, a defensive end from Michigan State University. So then the other kind of like, I guess you could say administrative part, scheduling and such goes, it was kind of declared that leagues would play separate through the 1969 season. The AFL versus AFL teams and NFL versus NFL teams. In preseason games, they'd play against each other. But this would start with an annual AFL-NFL World Championship game to be played between the champs of both leagues, you know, right away, immediately. Thus, creating the first ever Super Bowl. You know, more on that later in an episode. Then in 1970, the leagues would officially merge into one entity, continuing under the name of the National Football League, with two separate conferences. And you guessed it, the AFC and the NFC. But with this merger in 1970, the history and the records of the AFL would not be lost nor forgotten. They would kind of merge into the NFL lore. So then we could continue to have any kind of, you know, Lance Allworth type of crazy records and that kind of thing. Hey, yeah, you count. You're you're in the NFL. Yeah, Joe Namath, you're in the NFL now. When this all happened, the AFL would end up abolishing their office of the AFL commissioner and recognize the NFL commissioner as overall chief, which was Pete Rozelle at the time. A side note. Something interesting I saw was the NFL Films crew started recording AFL game footage in 1968, and they called this the AFL Films Division. But really, it was just a fancy name. It was just the same NFL Films dudes, you know, wearing AFL jackets. But hey, you got to make some kind of compromise, right? During all of this, the AFL, even though they lost the commissioner, they did create a position of the AFL president, you know, to kind of handle the operations and the merger stuff and that kind of thing and supposedly they wanted the then AFL commissioner Al Davis to take the job but he was first of all not too thrilled with the meetings that happened behind his back and he didn't like that and uh also supposedly he was not about to submit himself as a subordinate to Pete Rozelle he would only be on the top and that is it so he resigned on July 25th of 1966, and he went back to just being an owner coach of the Raiders. So, all this being said, like I uh, discussed, they had to take it before Congress. They went in front of the 89th U.S. Congress to try to be exempt from antitrust law sanctions and get this thing pushed through. New York Congressman Emanuel Seller chaired the sessions. Pete Rozelle, during these Congress court sessions, he kept making these three points. And these three points were he promised that the merger allowed no teams would leave existing cities. The league would eventually expand to the 28 stipulated and merger agreement, and teams with seating capacity of less than 50,000 would be declared inadequate for professional football. I mean, these were all kind of saying that this is a good thing for the AFL and NFL to merger because if they did merge, then it would just create even more of a fan base for the cities, which creates more money for the region. Because, of course, you know, you figure if they're merging and they're going to have this monopoly, then they can just hold all the quiche for themselves. But that was not their intentions. It was to keep the league, both leagues, thriving for a long time. Then the date of victory was upon us. October 21st, 1966, Congress approved the AFL-NFL merger. Legislation passed that exempted the agreement itself from antitrust action. One stipulation, however, was that each league had to add a team before 1970. Louisiana Representative Hale Boggs and Senator Russell Long played key roles in getting this passed. So, of course, New Orleans Saints, there you go, man. And President Lyndon B. Johnson would sign this bill. And now, it is on. The agreement, at time, Congress made the call was only based on a summary. The official document that they would create was dated December 1st, 1966. 
And Paul Tagliabue, in a video that came out later, of course, said that this was the most important document setting up the second 50 years of NFL history. So to help wrap this thing up a little bit, ultimately for the merger to happen, Roselle wanted to have even conferences, you know, even amount of teams on both sides, which meant that three of the NFL teams would have to make that leap, as in still be the NFL because they're merging, but you go from the NFC to the AFC. And, I mean, you're talking about some teams that were the NFL thinking they're, you know, going to the, I'm using quotes here, inferior league or conference. It was Art Modell, owner of the Cleveland Browns at the time, that kind of helped push this thing through. And here's a quote that explained his perspective. The stalemate became bitter. I was president of the league then, and I felt I had an obligation to break the stalemate. I said, guys, I have something to tell you. I said, I'm going to move my franchise to the American Football Conference, providing two things. That Wellington Merrick gives me his blessing, and Art Rooney comes along with me. So there you go. The Cleveland Browns and the Pittsburgh Steelers would jump from the NFC to the AFC. And coming with them would be the Baltimore Colts, all switching from the AFC to perform the action that Pete Rizzo wanted of having two even conferences, solidifying the merger, creating what is now the NFL in its current state, minus a few different, you know, add-on teams that will come through. With that being said, Art Modell summed up what he felt was the importance of the merger at the end of this following quote, and the whole thing went as such. The success of that merger was first affected by Tex Schramm on our side, and several of those men on the AFL side. Ralph Wilson, Lamar Hunt, I never thought we would get that far. There was some tremendous opposition on our side against the AFL. I didn't share those feelings. I thought they were a good league and had good names among players, coaches, and owners. They were well-coached teams. I believed it would have been nice to get together and merge for the good of pro football. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets of one of the most important events in NFL history. Next week, we continue to the AFL story by stepping back in our DeLorean to head back to the formation of the only league that really challenged the NFL for the throne of professional football. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, Please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to the footballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs>